quickly before this video starts, I just wanted to mention that this is a re-upload. My original video received a strike, putting my channel at risk of termination, even though it clearly falls under fair use. So if there's anything you notice about this video which is weird or off, it's because it's been edited different to avoid it. Anyway, thank you. If you thought the first Human Centipede movie was bordering on being too much to handle, do yourself a favour, don't watch this movie. In my video on the first Human Centipede movie, I said that the idea is far more disturbing than the execution, and it seemed quite tame in comparison to what the filmmakers actually could have done if they really wanted to be gross. <sighs> Well, this is not that at all. Everything about this movie aims to make you feel as uncomfortable and as gross as possible. And as things progress and things escalate, so do the themes of pure degeneracy. The universe in which this movie is set in, the original film, The Human Centipede, is just that. It's a film within this universe. So does that make this set in reality? We're introduced to this, um, uh, interesting looking man. He appears to be a security guard in an underground car park. It seems that he likes to enjoy his time by constantly rewatching The Human Centipede. That's gotta be healthy. He notices strangers arguing on the CCTV cameras and decides to go check it out. After being briefly berated by the angry man, he shoots him in the foot, bashes his skull in with a crowbar, and then shoots the woman in the leg and bashes her as well. This movie has just started. It's not wasting any time. There's not going to be any fluff solely for the purpose of padding. You've sat down to watch a movie called The Human Centipede 2. You know what's coming, so why waste any time? You then see him loading up his van with his newly acquired victims, but then you find out he's already got a person restrained in there. A guy absolutely infatuated with the human centipede is attacking and kidnapping people. Oh god. We learn that he's using his position as a security guard to religiously re-watch the movie and look for victims to kidnap. He's even got a scrapbook dedicated to the human centipede. Some people like to make scrapbooks for fun memories, times with their family, things their kids have done. But not this guy. This guy's got one dedicated to a movie where people have their faces surgically attached to someone else's anus. After snatching someone else up, after spotting them on camera, he visits a warehouse with the landlord in order to find a place suitable for, well, you know what he's about to do. He ends up killing the landlord by presumably shooting him in the gut, and he seems to get visibly upset once he realises he's dead. He's not upset because a man has died right in front of him or he's killed someone. No, he's upset because he's unable to use him for his sick agenda. We then learn he's living with his mentally abusive mother, who blames him for his father being put in prison because his father molested him when he was a child. Yeah, she blames him. Nice one, mum. The mother is so mentally damaged that she tells her son on multiple occasions she wishes both of them would just die. Everything in this world is just so disgusting and bleak. This mentally challenged man was psychologically and sexually abused by his own father and is now being mentally tormented by his own mother, who openly wishes for his death. I'm sure this is a breeding ground for happiness and positivity. You might have noticed that everything in this movie just looks gross. It's all so dirty and damp looking. The whole thing is just incredibly unsettling to watch, with its low lighting and creepy atmospheric music. That's a feeling which persists throughout the whole movie. And I've got to give props for managing to create such an unsettling and foreboding feeling. Even in the scenes which aren't necessarily supposed to be vile, there's something just dirty and gross about them. It's at this point that the movie starts to pick up its pace, and it's not exactly like things were moving slowly beforehand. He spots more potential victims on his monitor, and after springing an ambush and shooting through the front window, he bludgeons the man with his crowbar, and then you see him looking through the car window at a woman who is holding a small child. It then cuts to him holding the child and comforting it. This child is the only thing in the movie he's shown any compassion for. Maybe it's something to do with how he was abused as a child and it makes him feel sorry for the kid. He puts the child back in the car and then proceeds to bash the woman over the head with a crowbar. Oh yeah, and she's pregnant. If the first movie aimed to tell more of a disturbing story and leave a lot of the horror up to the viewer's imagination, leaving them wondering, what if that was me? Well, this one just flat out aims to be as vile and disgusting as possible, purely for the sake of being vile and disgusting. It then cuts to him having some sensual alone time, using sandpaper as lubricant, as you do. Two women catch him in the act, and then they get added to his list of victims. 
You might have noticed, he's acquired quite a large amount of captives at this point. And he's not done. He's back at home now, and he catches his mentally unwell mother attempting to murder him in his sleep. He looks completely unfazed, and just gets back into bed as if he didn't witness his mother attempting to give him new multiple breathing holes. His mother then discovers and destroys his beloved scrapbook, and he's not so happy about that. So he decides to give his mother what she's been asking for. He holds her head over his pet centipede so it can attack her, before then retrieving his crowbar and replacing her skull with a big mushy pile of brains. If all of the other previously mentioned events didn't let you know that this guy wasn't all quite there, well he sits his mother's corpse at the dinner table and proceeds to eat breakfast just like he would any other day. He then entices his upstairs neighbour to come down after banging on the ceiling with a broom, before then shooting him and cracking him over the head with a crowbar. In any other video I do, I'd more than likely state, this is where he decides to go all out and start kidnapping people to enact his sick fantasy. But I can't. His sick fantasy had already started before the movie had even begun. He already had a victim in the back of his van before we ever saw him do anything nefarious. We're just here for the ride at this point. One long roller coaster of crowbar beatings, brain bashing, and people shooting. He goes back to work and notices two people in the car park engaging in coitus. Because that's a clear breach of car park security and a blatant violation of the rules, he strolls up, shoots two of them, bashes one over the head to keep for later, and then notices his family doctor in the back seat. I didn't mention the doctor earlier, because let's be honest, this film has contained enough misery. But this doctor's got a thing for him, and he's been touching him inappropriately when making house visits, and god knows what off screen which we haven't seen. So instead of keeping this guy alive, like he has done with all the others, he just straight up executes him on the spot, and then goes and grabs the other person he shot as they tried to flee. Due to his fascination with the film, throughout the movie he's been attempting to acquire the cream of the crop. He's been ringing up the agent of one of the actresses from the first movie, under the guise of there being an audition for a Quentin Tarantino movie. And well, he gets her too. At this point, he's managed to gather a rather comical amount of victims. Most of this movie is fully dedicated to him capturing people, it's not even worth keeping track of how many there are at this point. Finally, after all of the feet shooting and crowbar hijinks, it is finally going to happen. But you know how in the first movie, where the bad guy was this world-renowned Siamese twin surgeon? Well this dude ain't. As you might have guessed from his preferred method of incapacitating his victims, shooting them and then bludgeoning them, he doesn't even have any anesthesia. So we all know what he's trying to do right. Instead of using any sort of clean, sterile surgical precision, he resorts to bashing people's teeth out with hammers and attempting his surgical procedure with dirty knives, scissors, and a damn staple gun. And he does it. The movie's shown plenty of graphic, disgusting, and disturbing things up to this point. It sure as hell isn't going to hold back now. Oh god no. When I covered the first movie, I said that the director had an opportunity to show far more disturbing scenes. Well this is exactly that. Unfortunately, the pregnant woman from earlier on in the movie dies. He has another little cry, because of course he does. He doesn't care about this woman or her unborn baby, he just wants to staple her into a centipede. It almost reminds me of the way a child would cry after their toy breaks or they don't get what they want. Which is, um, disturbing to say the least. He gets done mashing together his grotesque creation of pain and suffering. And it's basically exactly what you'd expect, given everything this movie has done so far. Just like the doctor this copycat looks up to, he attempts to have the centipede walk around, and even tries doing things like brushing the individual's hair. Kinda like how you might groom a dog, but something about the gritty, dark, dirty nature of all of this makes it feel far more twisted than the original. Yeah, a psychotic doctor with the ability to actually carry out this experiment is scary but a mentally challenged, delusional, childlike man doing it with dirty knives and a staple gun definitely takes the cake in the messed up factor. There is something comical about the absurdity of all of this. Like the sheer amount of people he's actually managed to stick together is just pure insanity at this point. But with the cinematography, the stylistic choices the movie takes, and the excellent use of ambient and background noise, the hairs on the back of my neck would constantly be sticking up. He attempts to feed the person at the front of the centipede, but ends up resorting to shoving a funnel all the way down her throat, so that he's able to pour food in after she refuses to willingly eat. And after she has a good old scream about it, he decides the best course of action is to not tie duct tape over her mouth or anything. No, 
he decides that pulling her tongue out of her mouth will all around be the best option here. I'm no doctor, and neither is this guy for that fact, but I'm pretty sure you'd still be able to scream without a tongue. If not able to scream, you'd still absolutely be able to make noises. Having no tongue doesn't mean you're just unable to make sound come out of your mouth. But let's be real, there's no logic in questioning this guy's problem solving skills at this point. He starts to get overly excited at the prospect of people passing food through their systems, if you know what I mean. He starts making fart noises with his mouth and starts rubbing on the victim's stomachs. And he's jumping around, getting all animated about it, like a little kid getting overly excited about something. But after about 30 seconds of waiting, he starts to get frustrated and resolves his problem by injecting them all with laxatives. And then exactly what you would expect to happen, well happens. He is overcome with joy. He is absolutely ecstatic at the prospect of many people trapped together, violently emptying their bowels. Because he's no surgeon, and hasn't gone about this in the best of ways, many of them start, well, leaking. You might have noticed that this movie has chosen a stylistic choice to be displayed in black and white. A choice that I think greatly benefits it in creating this dark, dirty, gritty atmosphere. But there's an exception to that rule. Absolutely everything is devoid of colour, except the explosive faeces. I was a bit caught off guard by that. I'm not sure if it was done to let the viewer know exactly what that fluid was, although it is more than obvious what is happening, or if it was done purely for the gross out factor. I'll be honest, it was gross, but I'm not too certain if the colour of it had anything to do with that fact. The pregnant woman who died before is in fact not dead anymore. It's more than likely that she was just unconscious or something and that guy didn't realise. But she makes a run for it as her water's breaking, she manages to get outside of the warehouse and lock herself in his car. And things go from bad to worse. She ends up giving birth in the car, just as this little guy's trying to break his way into it. And then for me, perhaps the most disturbing or just plain what the hell scene happens. The baby is born, but lands on the floor beneath the pedals. And she just crushes it as she reverses and escapes. What the fuck? That was probably the only scene that genuinely shocked me and had any sort of lasting effect. Sure, all the other stuff is dark and messed up, but I was 100% expecting that when I sat down to watch this movie. But a newborn baby getting crushed beneath a car pedal? That I was not expecting. Back inside the warehouse, one guy manages to rip his face from the anus of another person, causing some pretty serious damage in the process. The would-be surgeon, already mad that one of his victims has just escaped, upon seeing this, he decides to pull out his gun and flat out just start executing everyone in that line with absolutely no hesitation. The woman from the front of the other line manages to direct her part of the centipede to the light switch and turn it off. When he turns the light back on, she throws his pet centipede's enclosure at him, which he apparently now has with him here and not at home where it was before. He shoots a person at the back of that line, but now he's out of ammo. Perhaps now he'll calm down and stop killing the- Oh no, he's resorted to sawing through their necks. He goes to kill the final woman, but just as he's about to, she gives him a low blow, and as he's down, she uses the food funnel from earlier to give a new home to his pet centipede. Standing up in extreme pain, he stabs her too, then waddles off to a vehicle and leaves. You might think, just like the first movie, finally this piece of shit is about to get his comeuppance and die. After all of that pain and suffering he's inflicted, he's finally going to meet his demise. Perhaps the centipede will burrow its way out of his insides, killing him in the process. But then it cuts to him at his job again, re-watching the human centipede movie. His interest is piqued by the cries of a young boy, the young boy he left there earlier, and then the movie just ends. What a ride. If the sole purpose of this movie was just to simply shock and disgust the viewer, then it absolutely achieves its goal. This definitely falls under the criteria of video nasty. Everything in this movie is just so gross. It is overly graphic purely for the sake of being so, and manages to make the first movie seem like a children's film in comparison. Whereas in the first film, it seemed like the premise of it, the general idea of it, was far more disturbing than the actual execution. Almost as if it could have been some sort of urban legend or incredibly messed up wives tale as why you shouldn't go knocking on strangers doors. It held back from being vile purely for the sake of being vile. But this film, boy does this film absolutely go all the way out. But to be honest, by making a sequel from the first movie, it's probably the best thing they could have done. 
as the original movie garnered quite a reputation from normies as being quote, the most messed up movie of all time, it's like the filmmakers went, alright, you want messed up do you? Well we'll give you messed up. And thus, The Human Centipede 2 was born. Oh I feel dirty. Thanks for watching, I'm gonna go take a shower now.